This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 96, for broadcast on the 15th of December 2017. Coming up on Space Time, the earliest supermassive black hole ever seen, huge primordial galaxies discovered swimming in a vast ocean of dark matter, and strange clouds discovered in the Milky Way. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered the most distant and consequently earliest supermassive black hole ever seen. This monstrous gravity well is some 800 million times the mass of our Sun and was discovered in the early universe just 690 million years after the Big Bang. The observations were based on the identification of a quasar named J1342 plus 0928. However, the discovery, reported in the journal Nature, raises serious questions about science's understanding of how such a huge black hole could have formed at a time when the cosmos was just 5% of its present age. Finding such a massive black hole so early in the universe may provide some important clues on the conditions of the cosmos at this time, conditions which allowed black holes in the order of hundreds of thousands of solar masses to come into being. This object, unlike any black holes that form in the local universe, which rarely, if ever, exceed an initial mass of maybe a dozen or so solar masses. Adding to this black hole's intrigue is the environment in which it formed. You see, J1342 plus 0928 existed during the epoch of reionization. This is a period when the early universe emerged from the cosmic dark ages, a time when the universe emitted no light because gravity was still in the process of condensing matter sufficiently to form the very first stars and galaxies. The story of cosmology goes something like this. The universe began in what cosmologists call a Big Bang approximately 13.8 billion years ago. It started out as this superheated quark-gluon plasma of particles, which almost instantaneously spread apart during a period called cosmic inflation. No one knows how cosmic inflation happened, but they know it must have happened in order to explain the appearance of the universe as we see it today. You see, it looks pretty much the same in all directions, and scientists haven't been able to figure out how to explain that without cosmic inflation. Trouble is, they can't really explain cosmic inflation either. Things get a bit more easy to understand about 370,000 years after the Big Bang. That's when these primordial particles had cooled sufficiently to begin coalescing into the very first protons. Those protons then combined with electrons to create the first atoms of neutral hydrogen. At the same time, the first neutrons were formed. These neutrons then combined with some of the protons and electrons to form the first atoms of helium, as well as trace amounts of other elements, such as lithium and beryllium. This process also allowed photons to begin moving around, giving us what we now refer to as the cosmic microwave background radiation, a sort of snapshot of the early universe. Still, the universe remained opaque in the so-called cosmic dark ages for at least another 400 million years after the Big Bang. That is, until gravity had condensed enough matter to form the very first stars and galaxies. And the energy released by these first stars and galaxies caused the neutral hydrogen gas to lose an electron and become reionized. As the expanding universe continued to become reionized, photons could travel freely through space, allowing the universe to become transparent for the first time. Basically, that was when the universe started to look the way it does now. And by this time, the expanding universe was big enough to prevent most of the reionized hydrogen from regaining those lost electrons. And so it's remained with this basic appearance. OK, now back to our story. Scientists have deduced that the black hole which formed quasar J1342 plus 0928 took shape just as the universe was undergoing its fundamental shift from the opaque environment of the cosmic dark ages into this epoch of reionization. The authors believe that this newly discovered black hole existed in an environment which would have been about half neutral and half ionized. The study's lead author, Eduardo Bernardos from the Carnegie Institute, says explaining the gathering of all this mass in under 690 million years is an enormous challenge for theories of supermassive black hole growth. The quasars evidence that the newly found black hole is voraciously devouring material at the centre of an ancient galaxy. 
Material being sucked into a black hole first falls onto an accretion disk around the black hole where it's crushed, stretched and ripped apart at the subatomic level by the black hole's unimaginable gravitational forces. Most of this material will eventually be dragged past a point of no return called an event horizon, beyond which it will fall forever into the black hole's singularity. However, some of this accretion disk debris will escape that fate, instead being funneled along magnetic field lines towards the black hole's poles, where it's then blasted out into deep space at superluminal speeds by powerful energy jets known as quasars. Quasars are among the brightest and most distant known celestial objects, visible across vast expanses of the cosmos. It's thanks to the quasar that this unexpected black hole was discovered. The discovery is actually based on data amassed from observatories around the world. It includes key spectroscopic data from the 8-metre Gemini telescope on Hawaii's Mauna Kea, which helped to determine the black hole's enormous mass. Gemini's near-infrared spectrograph allowed the authors to probe the black hole's magnesium spectral lines. Magnesium lines are crucial for determining black hole mass, but for objects at this distance, the red shifting of the light caused by the expansion of the universe makes them extremely difficult to capture due to absorption by water vapour in Earth's atmosphere. Gemini's unique equipment was, however, able to do it. Other observatories involved in the discovery include Carnegie's Magellan Telescopes in Chile and NASA's Earth-orbiting WISE Wide-Field Infrared Survey Explorer spacecraft. Now, we spoke earlier about redshifts. The quasar's distance was determined by what we call its redshift. It's a measurement of how much the wavelength of its light is stretched by the expansion of the universe before reaching the Earth. It's caused by the Doppler shift effect on objects moving either towards us or away from us. It's the same as the change in pitch you hear when a train goes past. As something moves towards you, the pitch increases because the wavelengths are getting shorter. And when something's moving away from you, the pitch drops because the wavelengths are getting longer. Longer wavelengths are at the red end of the spectrum and shorter wavelengths towards the blue end. And the newly discovered quasar has a redshift of 7.54 based on the detection of the ionised carbon emissions from the galaxy that's hosting the black hole. Prior to this discovery, the record holder for the most distant known quasar was at 13 billion light years, a time when the universe was just 800 million years old. Astronomers are guessing up to 100 quasars just as bright and distant as this object are likely to exist over the sky. It's just a question of finding them. Bernardo says the discovery shows that a process obviously existed in the early universe to make this monster possible. It's thought that black holes grow by accreting or absorbing mass from their surrounding environment. But that's not a really fast process, and an extremely large black hole such as this one should take fairly long timescales to form, certainly much longer than the 690 million year age of the universe at that time. Still, the universe's very first stars were formed out of virtually pure hydrogen and helium, and so they're believed to have been far more massive than any stars in the universe today. Astronomers still say it's still unrealistic to expect an 800 million solar mass black hole to have formed quite so quickly. So, there's got to be another way that it formed. But as to what that process is, well, that's something scientists still need to try and work out. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have been given a rare glimpse of a magnetic field around a black hole. The opportunity was provided thanks to a sudden flare and cooling of gas around a black hole in a binary system. And the findings reported in the journal Science provided quite a shock for astronomers because the black hole's magnetic field turns out to be far weaker than expected. As we mentioned earlier, black holes feed by consuming material from their environment. In this case, it's a neighbouring star in a binary system. Now, before being eaten by the black hole, this material amasses onto an accretion disk. Above this accretion disk is what's known as an accretion disk corona, and the behaviour of these coronas are governed by the black hole's magnetic field. Understanding the magnetic field within this accretion disk corona is important because that affects the flow of gas around the black hole. The problem is there have been very few measurements of such fields to date. However, on June 15, 2015, astronomers got lucky. They detected a sudden flare from a binary system known as V404 Cygni, which contains a stellar mass black hole about nine times the mass of our Sun. V404 Cygni is located about 7,800 light years away in the constellation Cygnus the Swan. 
The authors quickly mobilised an armada of radio, infrared, optical and X-ray telescopes, pointing them at the black hole to collect as much data as they could during the two-week-long outburst. The last time the same black hole had a similar episode was 1989. What astronomers were looking for was a sudden drop in the system's electromagnetic radiation as the accretion disk corona cooled. That allowed them to measure V404-Cygni's magnetic field. But surprisingly, the authors found the magnetic energy around the black hole was about 400 times lower than what was expected. Now, these unexpectedly low measurements will force new constraints on theoretical models trying to explain how black holes consume material and generate their powerful superluminal jets. All previous models have always focused on what they thought would be strong magnetic fields accelerating directing the jet flows. The black hole in the V404 Cygni system is classified as a microquasar because of the jets that are shooting out from it. Its binary companion is an early spectrotype K orange star, slightly smaller and cooler than the Sun. The star and the black hole orbit each other about every 6.47 Earth days. Now, due to their proximity and the intense gravity of the black hole, the companion star is constantly losing mass under the accretion disk around the black hole and ultimately into the black hole itself. The V in the name indicates that it's a variable star, which repeatedly gets brighter and dimmer over time. It's also considered a nova, because on at least three occasions in the 20th century, it's produced extremely bright outbursts of energy. Finally, it's also a soft X-ray transient, because it periodically emits short bursts of X-rays. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new cosmic map of high-velocity clouds has uncovered several in the Milky Way that appear to be moving in a different direction to the rest of the galaxy. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, are raising questions about the possible origins of these mysterious cloud structures. The clouds were identified in the most detailed map ever developed of clouds of high-velocity gas in the local universe. The map covers the entire sky and shows these curious clouds of neutral hydrogen gas moving at very different speeds to the normal rotation of the Milky Way. Scientists study molecular hydrogen clouds because they're prime candidates for star formation. The new map was created by Dr. Tobias Westmeyer from the University of Western Australia. Westmeyer says the map shows at least 13% of the sky is covered by these clouds. He says these are clearly separate objects, moving either towards or away from us at speeds of up to a few hundred kilometres per second. The map was compiled by taking images of the sky and masking out gas that was moving at the same pace as the Milky Way in order to show the location of gas travelling at a different speed. The result is the most sensitive and highest resolution all-sky map of high-velocity clouds ever created. And it shows the gas in spectacular detail, revealing never-before-seen filaments, branches and clumps within the clouds. In fact, Westmeyer says the new map showing detailed structure within these high-velocity clouds simply wasn't visible in the past. And they're details which could provide new clues about the origins of these clouds as well as the physical conditions within them. For his research, Westmeyer used surveys combining observations from the CSIRO's Park 64-metre radio telescope in Australia and the Eiffelsberg 100-metre radio telescope operated by the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Several hypotheses have been proposed to explain where these high-velocity clouds come from. See, astronomers already know that one of these long trails of gas, known as the Magellanic Stream, originated from two neighbouring dwarf galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds. The stream connects them and then links them with the Milky Way. But the origins of all the remaining high-velocity clouds remains a mystery. Westmeyer says that until about a decade ago, even the distances to high-velocity clouds was unknown. Astronomers now know the clouds are very close to the Milky Way, within about 30,000 light-years of the galactic disk. And that means they're likely to either be gas falling into the Milky Way, such as the Magellanic Stream, or alternatively, outflows from the Milky Way itself. And that could be caused by things like star formation or a supernova explosion. Neutral hydrogen is one of the the most common elements in the universe, and uh, so it's very common and therefore easy to detect, and it's gas is the stuff from which stars are made, and so that makes it very interesting. The way this all started is back in the 1960s, when people were starting to look for neutral hydrogen emission in the sky. They then found positions in the sky where there was gas which had velocities that didn't quite agree with what you would expect for gas participating in in the general rotation 
formation of our galaxy. And so these clouds were then termed high-velocity clouds because of their unusually high radial velocities. And over time, people then started to find more and more of these and noticed that they were forming large complexes on the sky. The most famous probably is the Magellanic Stream, which is a long gas filament that we know today is connected to the Magellanic Cloud and represents a tidal gas stream that was ripped out of the Magellanic Clouds due to gravitational forces. More than 10% appear to be these high-velocity clouds. Yeah, so a significant fraction of the sky is covered with these high-velocity clouds. From my research, I find about 13% of the sky is covered with high-velocity gas, but that's likely only the tip of the iceberg because we can only detect neutral hydrogen, but there is a lot more gas potentially out there that is ionized, and we can't detect that very easily with radio telescope. Then there might be additional gas that have velocities that just happen to be similar to those of the galactic disk, even though the gas is not part of the disk. And so there's likely to be even more gas out there that, that we can't really see with a radio telescope. When you look for neutral hydrogen gas, how do you look for it? Yeah, so we use large radio telescopes, such as the Eva Parks radio telescope in New South Wales. And uh, neutral hydrogen is emitting a so-called uh, spectral line. So it emits radiation at a specific frequency, which is uh, called the, the 21 centimeter line. So what we essentially do is we detect that 21 centimeter line with the telescope and then essentially map the whole sky and that way we generate a map of how the gas is distributed across the sky. Is there any sort of pattern to them? Uh, are they all in the one place or are they all spread fairly evenly across the galaxy or uh, are they all around the galactic halo? Where are they? Well there certainly are patterns. So the, the gas is not uh, just randomly distributed across the sky but high velocity clouds tend to form large complexes and filaments, some of which extend across tens of degrees on the sky. So if we had eyes that could see radio emission, it would look rather spectacular. And we only know the distances of very few of these clouds. And uh, generally, they are within about 10,000 parsecs. So that is about 32,000 light years of the galactic disk. So they're, they're relatively nearby, sitting right above the disk of the Milky Way and inside the gaseous halo of the Milky Way. All right, we know at least one of them is uh, a result of the gravitational interaction between the Milky Way and the large and small Magellanic clouds. What do we know about the others? What do we think we know about the others, if anything? Yeah, it's very difficult to actually determine what the origin of these clouds is because of our difficulty, first of all, to measure exact distances for these diffuse clouds. One way to get an idea of where they might come from is to measure the abundance of heavier chemical elements in those clouds. And people have done that in the past in a few cases. And we usually find abundances that are about one-tenth of the uh, chemical abundances of the sun. And that tells us something about the, the origin of these clouds. So they can't possibly come from the Milky Way because in that case we would expect abundances of heavier elements that are similar to what we see in the galactic disk but it's more likely that that gas is actually coming from outside the Milky Way either gas that is left over from the formation of the local group and is now getting accreted onto the Milky Way or um, as is the case for the Magellanic clouds that uh, we are looking at gas that was ripped out of satellite galaxies of the Milky Way in the past and is now falling into the Milky Way and towards the galactic disk. So so by looking at the metallicity in these clouds, you can use that as a fingerprint to try and determine where they come from. Exactly. So it gives you an idea of whether the gas could potentially come from the Milky Way itself or whether it needs to have a different origin. And the fact that the chemical abundances are so much lower than what we see in the neighborhood of the sun tells us that the gas must be coming from outside somewhere. Do we understand the metallicities of neighboring galaxies very well? We definitely have measurements, uh, for instance, of the Magellanic clouds, which is very useful because that again gives us an idea of where the gas in the Magellanic stream comes from and uh, indeed its metallicity agrees with that of the small Magellanic cloud reasonably well and so that makes believe that the small Magellanic cloud is actually the origin of the, the gas in the Magellanic stream. Okay, where to next with the research? Um, yeah, that's a good question. There are still a lot of things to study so to begin with we are not entirely sure of the origin of many of these clouds so there is some more work to be done and the other interesting question is what the future of those clouds will be. And so we have evidence that a lot of them are interacting with the gas and halo of the Milky Way. And so it is likely that they will eventually end up being accreted by the Milky Way and being incorporated into the gas uh, content of our own Milky Way. And that is an interesting prospect because that gas could potentially then fuel a future star formation in the Milky Way if it can somehow end up in the galactic disk. And so that is an interesting area of 
research to assess how much gas could potentially be accreted onto the Milky Way and what kind of star formation rate that could potentially translate into in the future. That's Dr. Tobias Westmeyer from the University of Western Australia node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Now, earlier we were talking about giant black holes near the dawn of time. Well, astronomers have also been astounded by the discovery of two massive primordial galaxies swimming in a vast ocean of dark matter just 780 million years after the Big Bang. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are forcing scientists to go back to their drawing boards to try and explain how such massive objects, both the galaxies and the black hole, could have formed so soon after the universe was born. See, astronomers always expected to see their first galaxies, those that formed in the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang, to share many similarities with some of the dwarf galaxies seen in the nearby universe today. These early agglomerations of a few billion stars would then merge with one another and gradually, over billions of years, become the larger galaxies that dominate the universe today. Trouble is, that's not what astronomers are seeing. And just like the black hole observation we mentioned earlier, this new galaxy observation is a great example of that. Astronomers using the South Pole Telescope initially identified a huge galactic-sized object, far more massive than they expected for such an early epoch in cosmic history. Now, these first observations indicated that this object, named SPT-0311-58, was very distant and glowing brightly in infrared, meaning that it was extremely dusty and likely to be going through a burst of star formation. However, later observations using ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope, identified it as actually being two separate massive star-filled galaxies, both of which were nestled inside an even more massive cosmic structure, a huge halo of dark matter, several trillion times more massive than the Sun. To make these observations, ALMA had a little help from a gravitational lens, providing a sort of supercharged observing boost for the telescope. Gravitational lenses form when an intervening massive object, like a foreground galaxy or galaxy cluster, bends and magnifies the light coming from a more distant object, such as a galaxy. However, in the process they can also distort the appearance of the object being lensed, and that requires sophisticated computer models to reconstruct the image as it would have appeared in its unaltered state. This de-lensing process provided some intriguing details about the galaxies, showing that the larger of the two is forming stars at an incredible rate, something like 2,900 solar masses per year. Now, by comparison, our own Milky Way galaxy is currently making only about one new solar mass worth of stars every year. This distant galaxy also contains about 270 billion times the mass of our Sun in gas, and nearly 3 billion times the mass of our Sun in dust. Now, just like your house, dust gathers over time. So that's an incredibly large amount of dust considering the young age of this system. The galaxy's rapid star formation was likely triggered by a close encounter with its slightly smaller companion, which already hosts about 35 billion solar masses of stars, and is increasing its own rate of starburst at some 540 solar masses per year. The galaxies of this early era during the period of reionization are far messier than the ones we see in the nearby universe today. They also have far more jumbled shapes. That'd be due to the vast stores of gas raining down on them and on their ongoing interactions and mergers with their neighbours. The new observations also allow the researchers to infer the presence of a truly massive dark matter halo surrounding both galaxies. And that's important because dark matter is needed to provide all that additional gravity, which is needed to collapse matter into galaxies, groups and clusters of galaxies. The amazing discovery pushes back the epoch of large galaxy formation by billions of years. It also suggests that smaller galactic building blocks must have been able to assemble into larger galaxies fairly quickly. The two galaxies are now very close to each other, less than 27,000 light years. Now, to put that into perspective, it's about the distance from the Earth to the centre of our own galaxy. At that distance, these two galaxies are bound to merge fairly soon, in the process forming the largest galaxy ever observed at that period in cosmic history. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Dan Marone from the University of Arizona in Tucson, says what astronomers are seeing is the most massive galaxy known in the first billion years of the universe in the process of assembling itself. Astronomers usually view this as a time of little galaxies working hard to chew away at the neutral intergalactic medium. 
But the mounting observational evidence is changing that story, pushing back the time when truly massive galaxies first emerged in the universe. For astronomers to understand if a galaxy makes sense in science's current understanding of cosmology, they need to look at the dark matter halo, the collapsed dark matter structure in which it resides. Astronomers know there's about four to five times as much dark matter as there is normal matter, the visible stuff you can see, like stars, gas and dust. That lets them estimate how much mass the invisible dark matter halo must have. By comparing their calculations with current cosmological predictions, the authors found that this halo must be about as massive as a dark matter halo could be at this time. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 